Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm like tremendously excited to be joined by Bethany Schmidt and Kate Herity, both of the University of Cambridge, who are here to uh, introduce and talk about our a path-breaking new edited collection that they have co-edited and contributed to on the theme of sensory penalities. That is uh, the way in which multi-sensorial experience of taste, sound especially, and touch are, are implicated in the way that we conceive of crime and punishment. And in many ways this work is at the, the cutting edge of a, a kind of new sonic boom <laughs> in criminal, criminological thinking. So I'm going to hand over to them in just a minute, um, but just introduce the speakers. Uh, Dr. Kate Herity is a junior research fellow at King's College Cambridge, interested in worrying the boundaries and meeting places between fields and disciplines, and particularly those related to sensory experience. And I know that she has some sensory experiences prepared, so uh, get ready for that. Uh, and Dr. Bethany Schmidt is a lecturer in penology in the Prison Research Centre, also University of Cambridge, whose work explores the moral quality of prison life with a particular interest in transitioning contexts. And uh, apologies have been sent, uh, sadly, from Dr. Jason War of the Montfort University, who is the other editor of that volume. Uh, who uh, sadly can't join us, but sends his best regards. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Kate and Bethany, but just a plug for the book before uh, they start. Uh, I've been told it will be dropping on your virtual bookshelves on the 8th of February, so just in time for Valentine's Day for the, for the loved ones in your life who are into and sen sensorial experiences of imprisonment. Uh, so without, without further ado, I'll hand cool. over to Kate and Bethany, and uh, video is off, please, and uh, I'll hear from you all soon. Cheers. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for attending. Thank you to the organizers for inviting us to share our work. We are delighted to have this conversation. Um, and we'd also like to thank all of the authors who contributed to the book, some of whom are with us here today, including Ali himself. So I'd like to start by laying some groundwork about the collection, its development, and what our intentions and hopes are with it. The book, as I'll discuss, is very much an intellectual and methodological project. So I plan to speak for about 15 minutes and then I'll hand over to Kate. A significant catalyst for this project was Kate's doctoral research, uh, an oral ethnography, and that's oral, A-U-R-A-L, which explored the significance of sound to those living and working in prison. And between the three of us and with colleagues, we seem to talk endlessly about the sensory in our fieldwork experiences, but these reflections were almost always kept in the margins of other work and left behind in field notes. This eventually led us to organize a panel at the 2018 European Society of Criminology Conference in Sarajevo. We called the panel The Sensual Prison. We quickly realized that the title was no good, but the topic was. The enthusiastic dialogue that arose from our presentations helped to confirm that there is an appetite for thinking and writing about the sensory within spaces of social control. And that's where the book was kind of birthed. And our aim for the book is to stimulate and advance the conversation about the role of sensory experience as a source of insight and understanding. Criminology has lagged behind other areas of the social sciences in taking the sensory seriously, both in the production of knowledge and as a means of empirical investigation. Related disciplines like anthropology, however, have embraced the instructive potentials of foregrounding the sensory. Sensory ethnography and the anthropology of the senses in particular are not nascent methodologies or conceptual orientations. Rather, they are ones that have both heritage and legitimacy. Foregrounding the sensory by thinking about sound, smells, taste, and touch, and utilizing these sources of information as a mechanism for understanding how the mind, body, and environment operate together dynamically, presents a new way of exploring phenomena which has long been the focus of criminological inquiry. 
This heightens awareness to a range of facets of experience, of crime, of punishment, of victimization, of state power, of harm, of control, that we have not accounted for in our classical and foundational texts. We contend that turning the criminological imagination towards those experiences, which often occur beyond, beyond the criminological gaze, opens up both old and new realms of inquiry. In this respect, we've sought to employ the sensory as a theoretical and analytical tool for understanding and investigation. In our introduction, we outline three interlocking and recurring themes. First, that the political, symbolic, and ideological are not only inherent to places and processes of punishment and social control, but are encoded in the sensorial outputs and transmissions occurring within those places and processes. This is related to what McClanahan and South hypothesize in the recent article on sensory criminology. For criminology, they write, the significance and power of the senses is particularly obvious when they are considered in terms of their removal, loss, degradation, or their weaponization. In our chapter on sensing transition in post-revolution Tunisia, for example, Andrew Jefferson and I discuss how the sensory can be weaponized, like when prison officers desecrated the food brought in for prisoners by their families. In one prison, the food searching process was a display of overt power and often punitiveness. Here, little care was taken when slicing open whole peppers or roasted chickens and, with regularity, the destruction of the food's integrity and aesthetic was <clears throat> intentional. When one food basket came in for a prisoner convicted of a terrorist offense, the officer deliberately rejected food that was technically allowed and mangled what was left. Food baskets in this prison would sit for hours before being delivered to their respective prisoner, cold and nearly unrecognizable. This was in contrast to another prison where there was an ethos of respect and preservation, do as little harm to the food as possible. And as one officer noted when carefully slicing open a whole fish, this is love, this food is their home, we try not to disrupt that. In this establishment, efforts were made to get the baskets delivered as fast as possible so that the warmth of the food would be retained. The sensory, in this case, was utilized by authorities as a means to demonstrate power and control in both positive and negative ways and as a form of moral communication. The second theme we identify is that places and processes of punishment and social control are experienced sensorially by those subject to them, those who work within them, and those who are researching them. In Jason's chapter, which opens with a vignette that depicts the experience of being in a prison cell during a fire, both from his own experience and amalgamated with others, he contends that the pressing and overwhelming sense of trappedness, helplessness, abandonment, and fear reveals that the deprivation of liberty is not just a removal from community, but also a complete and totally immersive sense of embodied captivity. This deprivation, he writes, is encoded within those evoked sensations. This is what the prison is and what it is designed to do. It reveals that the deprivation of autonomy is not just related to constrained choice and agency, but the rendering of utter helplessness. The person within the cell has no power to mitigate that sense of embodied captivity, even in a circumstance that could prove fatal to them. Our third and final theme is that in order to fully understand and theorize about penalities and places and processes of punishment and control, we need to account for the multifarious sensorial experiences and their effects. The jangling of prison officer keys, for example, may be a comforting sound to colleagues, a signal that communicates presence and available of backup. But for prisoners, this sound may be interpreted and felt very differently. As is clear throughout the book, penality has an inherent sensory component whether in the unregulated extreme temperatures found in a Japanese prison cell, what Yvonne Jukes and Alison Young describe as slow violence on behalf of the institution, or like in Jennifer Pierce's chapter, 
which contrasts the use of space surveillance and sounds in new and old prisons in the Dominican Republic. In one establishment, a Christian unit maintained control and compliance through the presence of evangelical pastors who walked through the sector with a portable microphone and speaker preaching about salvation and damnation, reminding prisoners that alcohol, drugs, adultery, and profane language were signs of the devil's presence. Whilst some of this, while some found this inescapable noise to be jarring or oppressive, others tolerated it or found great comfort in the sermons and their rhythmic messaging. We assert that by honing our sociological attention to these mundane everyday sensory experiences, we're able to move towards a more robust scholarship that operates within a greater democracy of the senses. This, the extension of sensorial inquiry into the criminological sphere is informed and inspired by an established body of literature on the anthropology of the sense, senses, as I mentioned earlier. This work is characterized by three main issues. It explores the question of the relationship between sensory perception and culture. It engages with questions concerning the status of vision and its relationship to other senses, and it demands a form of reflexivity that goes beyond the interrogation of how culture is written to examine the sites of embodied knowing. Lowe further notes that sensory studies argue for the senses as social, revealing important insights pertaining to selfhood, culture, and social relations. He also points out how sensory exploration confronts power imbalances in who produces knowledge and which knowledge is privileged. He writes, a common point of departure in sensory writings deals with the imperialism of sight and or the Western pentad sensory model that is critiqued as both Eurocentric and limiting in exploring various other sensory orders across different societies and sensory hierarchies. These fundamental themes of power, representation, identity, social relations, culture, and knowledge hierarchies neatly map on to the intentions of sensory penalities, as well as other more recent movements in our discipline like Southern and global criminology and attention to criminological decolonization. Our aim is to humbly disrupt epistemological assumptions about how criminological knowledge is produced, to consider the implications which arise from this for how we understand processes and practices of research, and to examine how different modalities of sensory engagement beyond the visual interact with the way people experience and make sense of their environments. An example of this comes from our study in Tunisia, where the use of haptic expressions was a, another way that linguistically the privileging of senses other than sight were communicated. When I asked a prisoner about whether the democratic revolution had changed prison life, he had been incarcerated before and after, he replied, does this feel like democracy? Suggesting that the texture and atmosphere of his carceral experience was embodied in a way that was separate from the material or optic evaluation of his surroundings. This is in contrast to prisoners in England, for example, who often say things like, does this look like rehabilitation? So to conclude, we suggest that criminology is experiencing something of a sensory turn, in part with the help of McClanahan and South's recent work, which provides a convincing argument for heightened criminological attention to the non-visual senses and how these might uncover new sites and modes of knowledge and a more richly effective criminology. In our book's foreword, Alison Liebling reminds us that we inhabit and come to know our worlds and the other people in it, in a body that feels, sees, hears, smells, can touch and be touched. Forgetting this, as Rowan Williams argues, is a philosophical mistake. Our bodies work intelligently, reading cues, interpreting tones, and registering injustice. The sensory and the moral work in tandem. So we leave you with some questions. What do we miss or overlook when we dismiss, ignore, or deny the senses? How do our researcher bodies perceive sensory stimuli related to pain, punishment, or deprivation? And how do the bodies of those inhabiting spaces of confinement or social control, social control experience these environments? <laughs>
We think these questions are critical for considering how the sensory interacts with penality. So thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Kate now. Hello, everyone. Um, I had to resist the urge to wave as I saw familiar people coming in. Um, it's lovely to almost see you. And thanks ever so much just to reiterate for both the invitation to speak today uh, and also to everyone who's contributed to the project. Um, it was an absolute joy to do the book and I will be very lucky if I have experiences to match it in the future, I'm really confident. Um, so forgive me, I've gone a little bit old school um, because tech has a habit of not working too well with me. So I've written up a script so I don't deviate too, too wildly. Um, I am using a little bit of sound here and there. I'll indicate where that is the case. Um, there is method to my madness, she says. Um, so today I want to talk specifically about sensing violence. By violence, I mean both the sense of behaviour involving physical force, uh, likely to result in hurt or damage to person or property, um, but also violence in the broader sense, a strength of emotion or a natural force, perhaps relating to destructiveness rather than itself destructive. How do we understand such things? How do we convey them? In the context of the book, the implication is that violence has sensory components. By way of demonstration, I want to begin in 1912, uh, the First Balkan War and Tommaso Marinetti's account of the siege of Adrianople, which was successfully captured by the Bulgarian army. Marinetti, Marinetti witnessed um, the warfare in his role as reporter and sought to convey his impressions using experimentation with sounds, otherwise known as con concrete poetry or typographic experimentation. His intent was to mediate the sounds of explosion and gunfire. Um, his poem, Zang Tum Tum, was intended to demonstrate that sound carried more, than, more power than the verbal meaning attached to what we conventionally understand as words. For our purposes, we'll gloss over the associations with fascism and its development and the glorification of war. This is a very old recording um, of Marinetti reading his poem. I'm not going to read the whole, play the whole thing for you, but just a snippet. Ogni cinque secondi cannoni d'assedio spencare spazio con un accordo. Ultimamento di 500 echi tra sannarlo, sviluzzarlo, sparpagliarlo all'infinito. Nel centro di quel pom pum, spiaccicati a un chiezza 50 km quadrati, balzare scoppi tagli pugni, batteria tirolata, violenza feroce, regolarità. Questo passo grave, scandali strani, folli agitatissimi, acuti della battaglia, furri, affanno, orecchi, occhi, narici, aperti, che gioia, vedere, udire, fiutare, tutto. Um, for those Italian futurists out there, I can provide a link should you want. Uh, Steve Goodman explores the power and violence of sensory imposition, specifically sound, in his 2012 book, Sonic Warfare, Sound Effect and the Ecology of Fear. Fear induced purely by sound effects, or at least in the undecidability between an actual or sonic attack is a virtualized fear. The threat becomes autonomous from the need to back it up. And yet the sonically induced fear is no less real. The same dread of an unwanted possible future is activated, perhaps all the more powerful for its spectral presence. Despite the rhetoric of such deployments do not necessarily attempt to deter enemy action to ward off an undesirable future, but are as likely to prove provocative to increase the likelihood of conflict to precipitate that future. What I'm most keen to emphasise before we go off too far on an Italian futurism or psychoacoustics tangent uh, is the very real effects Goodman identifies as resulting from a sensory onslaught. That conveying sensory violence, by which I mean the idea that making sounds or perhaps sights, smells, textures with force and power can be in and of itself violent or a violence in intention and or effect 
In her chapter, Sensing and Unease in Immigration Confinement and Abolitionist Perspective, Vicky Canning talks about her disorientation in navigating what she terms a triangle of variable confinements in Denmark. While this referred specifically to the sites in which she was conducting research, her discombobulation in the field resulted from a violent proximity, sensorially, experientially, as well as geographically, between these places of confinement and the violence of preparation for warfare and military activity. She talks about the harmful effects of asylum detention for those who have frequently escaped from war zones and find themselves sensorially assailed with reminders from nearby military maneuvers, as well as the tightening strategies of confinement. In the course of her exploration, she makes powerful parallels with her own experiences growing up in Northern Ireland. There are then comparisons to be drawn between states of violence and sites of violence. I'm not the first to suggest that prison can be so understood. Of course, there are numerous articulations of this in both academic literature and prisoner accounts. For example, in Haseen's Life Without Parole, whose evocative account of serving a life sentence in maximum security paints a vivid picture of living in a perpetual state of consumptive wariness. I knew I would have to submit to a cavity search, but it wasn't the strip search that dominated my memory of this event, it was the noise. Since concrete and steel do not absorb sound, the clamour and voices from within just bounced around, crashing into each other to create a hollow, booming echo that never ended. It sounded as if someone had placed a microphone inside a crowded locker room with the volume pumped up, broadcasting the noise all around the sally port. It was this deafening background noise that would lull me to sleep at night and greet me in the morning for the next five years. Though I have been out of Greaterford for many years now, its constant din still echoes in my ears. This sense of the endurance and resilience of sensory recollection is underpinned again by Jason's chapter where he recounts the sensory assault um, he underwent while being uh, banged up during a fire in a prison. What I wish to talk about here is what accounting for the sensory aspects of this does for our understanding of prison and its soundscape. In her recent post for our blog, which accompanies the book, sensorycriminology.com, Eleanor March um, talks about distance and sound in prisoner writing. And she draws attention to comparisons made within prisoner writing between the violence of warfare and that of the prison soundscape. The whack and thump recalls the crack and thump of the deadly weapons in the battlefield scene in an aural embodiment of the violence of prison enacted on human flesh. In this scenario, the language of proximity conveys the forced, unwanted physical proximity of prison life. Ultimately, the narrator's inability to decode the prison soundscape leaves him unable to adapt to prison life and the story ends with his suicide. Using Bourdieu, I argue in my thesis that the soundscape is a site of symbolic violence. Sound forms a key component of power maintenance. Auditory signifiers of power resonate with the privilege on which it depends, and social memory is reconstituted in their hearing. The clanging of gates, jangling of keys, reinforce the power and privilege those working for the prison have over those imprisoned within it. Those bangs and clangs resonate with a force reverberating far beyond their hearing. If navigation of the soundscape can be understood as integral to processes of coping and adaptation on an individual level, we can see how this is also the case for an individual in relation to the collective. As Eleanor March asserts, the ecology of survival depends on learning how to navigate the cadence of the prison soundscape and perhaps the soundscape more broadly. I discuss that in more depth elsewhere, but my thesis makes this point too. 
I argue that using sound or aural aspects of social experience in prison de-articulates power from order and in so doing lends additional dimensions to our understanding both of power and how it is enacted and constituted and in the ways order is maintained and disrupted on a basis that's detached from, auto from authority and the absence or presence of legitimacy. What does this mean for how we interpret the soundscape? Well, in my chapter, <clears throat> Hearing Order in Flesh and Blood, Sense Making and Attunement in the Pub and Prison, I refer to a point made by Derek, one of the prison officers I interviewed. Derek argued that key to his role was learning what he termed the everyday tune that's normal for here. He argued all prison spaces have one. And it is deviations from this everyday tune that denote trouble. Trouble itself has a particular set of markers. I borrow from Lefebvre to refer to this as arrhythmia. The rhythms of daily life have fallen into a discordant state and are no longer complementing one another, as is the case in a polyrhythmic everyday normal tune, where the hustle and bustle of daily life hums with the toing and froing of daily business. While my contribution to sensory penalities is primarily concerned with talking about what attending to sensory experience more closely does for how we understand the social world of the prison, I also use this as a means to explore a more practical demonstration of how we do this. I borrow from organisational theory to detail that process of acclimation to the environment. Lefebvre tells us the role of the rhythm analyst is to listen to these noises, murmurs, cacophonies, until we can discern individual strands within them and then bring them back together for some sense of the social whole. Sensing these spaces, I argue, is a process consisting of incremental stages of familiarity and proficiency. These stages can be broadly understood as sense making, acclimating and adapting to particular rules and the rhythms of behaviour, which have a meaning in particular social contexts, and then of attunement, becoming sufficiently familiar with these rhythms to decipher and interpret them. Banging is a feature of daily life inside, a means of communicating an array of things to wing and landing society from behind the door. There is a fair distinction between hearing a steady rhythmic bang and understanding this is impatience to be let out or a reminder that the cell incumbent feels an injustice at not being. This banging is a world away from a slow rhythmic banging. This represents a threat to the broader order. If taking place in the midst of lockdown, this provides a real and frightening reminder to staff that they are outnumbered, potentially overpowered, and only retain their position of authority by a grace that can be and may be withdrawn at any time. Underpinning this is years of experience in the bar trade. I deployed this partially subconsciously at the time and only later did I reflect on the extent to which learning how to read a senscape to predict and manage violence in the bar setting had coloured my assumptions, my understanding of what it was I was hearing, as well as what it was I was attempting to listen for. And so we argue, focusing on the sensory holds the promise of better representing the vagaries and vitality of human life within these penal spaces. And in so doing brings us closer to capturing our fellow humans as Vulcan entreats, as the sensate, suffering, skilled, sedimented and situated creatures we are. A sociology then of flesh and blood. <laughs> to arrive back at Marinetti, Zang Tum Tum, written from excerpts from journals taken at the scene of battle and published retrospectively, Eleanor March persuasively argues that language is used in prisoner writing to reduce distance between their experience and that of the wider readership. Through evocative writing and orientation to sensory experience, we can manipulate the proximity between participant and researcher, writer and reader within the walls and beyond them. This thick description in Acts of Versten. And so I end by passing on the gauntlet to you and ending where Bethany began to ask you to revisit those experiences and field notes with fresh eyes to disrupt your assumptions and unsettled perspectives, to ask yourselves what potential there is for expanding our understanding
of your understanding by attending more closely to sensory aspects of our thinking, our feeling and our theory. Thank you.